Hi, welcome to our virtual meeting. My name is Jerry Smiley and I'm the Orange Line Project Manager. Today I'm joined for this presentation by several members of the Orange Line Project team. Thank you all for taking the time to view this presentation and provide your feedback. Closed captioning is available in English and Spanish by clicking the CC button or the settings button on the bottom right of the video window. We have a lot of information to cover, so let's get started. Here's the agenda for our presentation. We'll start by reviewing the project background and describe where we are in the planning process. Then we'll explain the light rail con design considerations that have gone into the project's current conceptual design. We will also walk you through the project's alignment from end to end. The presentation will conclude with a recap of the environmental analysis process and the next steps for the project. If you are interested in more detailed information about a specific geographic area of the project, you can view the working group videos, which are also posted on the website. After you watch this video, we hope that you'll provide your feedback by leaving a comment on the website or completing the survey questions associated with each of the working group videos. So <clears throat> to start with the project background and get a refresher on the project. The Orange Line project is defined as light rail transit operating in a dedicated transit way from Tech Ridge Park and Ride on the northern end of the corridor to just north of Slaughter Lane on the southern end. Up to 22 stations are proposed along the route. Service would operate approximately every 10 minutes. Given recent trends in federal grant funding, the funding approved by the City of Austin voters would provide a local match to build an initial investment in the Orange Line from Stasny Lane to the North Lamar Transit Center. However, the project team is clearing the entire corridor from Slavery Lane to Tech Ridge Park and Ride through the federal NEPA process in the event that additional federal or other funding becomes available to expedite construction of the full corridor. As part of the initial investment, the northern and southern ends of the project would continue to be served by rapid bus. So this graphic is designed to represent the entire project life cycle with a focus on the phase we are in now, indicated by the shaded box. Prior to this phase, as shown, the orange and the blue line locally preferred alternatives were unanimously adopted by the Capital Metro Board of Directors and endorsed by the Austin City Council on June 10th, 2020. In November 2020, the City of Austin voters approved an 8.75 cent tax rate increase to help fund the next phase of the implementation for the system plan, which includes both orange and blue lines and allowed us to enter the phase we are in now, known as the NEPA and preliminary engineering phase. Earlier this year, we shared some information with the community on, NEPA process, on the NEPA scoping process for both projects and explained what to expect over the next few years. We are now moving into the next phase of the environmental or NEPA process, which is the development of the draft environmental impact statement. After this phase is complete, the project can move into final design and then construction and eventually testing and operation. An important aspect highlighted in this graphic is that the public engagement is conducted and conducted throughout the entire phase and future phases of this project. For more information about the project and the NEPA process, you can access materials developed for our scoping phase at projectconnect.com visit the Get Involved page, and then scroll to the bottom to look at the previous virtual meetings. There are four corridor design milestones that mark our progress on the project. At the same time as the environmental process that is underway, the engineering team has been working on the preliminary design plans for the project. The environmental analysis and the preliminary engineering influence each other as we work toward a final environmental impact statement and final 30% design plans. Today, we will be sharing information on the 15% design. The 30% design is planned to be complete in the spring of 2022. The 15% design includes a lot of elements, initial engineering alignments, estimated right-of-way requirements, and the identification of significant engineering and environmental challenges. During today's presentation, we will share the light rail design elements and criteria that inform the project's design. We will also discuss the constraints and considerations that have gone into determining options for solving complex engineering challenges within the corridor. These considerations and the community's input and on the project's design, including station design and amenities, will be used to refine the engineering plans. As part of the 15% design process, 
We'll also out, uh, analyze traffic impacts, develop initial estimates for things like service frequency and ridership. More information on these items, as well as the analysis of potential environmental impacts and mitigation strategies will be shared in the months ahead. To recap some of our recent engineering, environmental and public engagement efforts, we've conducted right of way and utility surveys and coordinated with the city of Austin on planned roadway, bicycle and pedestrian facilities and future development projects. We've also initiated archeological, environmental and historic resources field investigations. We've held two rounds of public meetings, including scoping meetings that were held between January and March this year, and then station alignment meetings that were held in April and May. This community input helps us understand community concerns and desires as we continue to design the project. More details about the community engagement and the input gathered so far is on the Project Connect website. Now, let's get into more detail about the light rail design elements that have informed the 15% design. For this, I'm gonna turn it over to Jonathan. Thanks, Jerry. This image illustrates the common elements of a street right of way that incorporates a light rail transitway and stations with other elements such as travel lanes for cars, street trees, bike paths, and sidewalks. Because there's limited space for transportation in the existing right of way, we must reimagine the right of way and consider trade offs for prioritizing the use of space and determine if we need to acquire more space while minimizing impacts. When we say reimagine the right of way, we mean that we can work to include safe pedestrian facilities, trees, dedicated space for cyclists, to prioritize connections to local bus routes, and to identify opportunities for public art. It's important to note that everywhere the light rail system will go and travel throughout the city, we're looking also at how we can improve the physical fabric of the city at the same time. We take a holistic, human-centered approach to designing the light rail system. A number of criteria influence the design of a light rail system. This includes technical requirements of the light rail system, such as the space needed for the transitway, typically about 28 feet, as well as the space needed for station platforms, the turning radius of the vehicles, and more. In addition, the Austin Strategic Mobility Plan, or ASMP, provides a criteria for accommodating Austin's multimodal transportation network, which includes bicycle and pedestrian facilities and travel lanes for cars and buses. Each of these facilities has a desired and minimum width and placement within the right-of-way. Because bicycle and pedestrian facilities are so critical to a successful transit network and meeting the goals of ASMP are important to Capital Metro and the Austin Transit Partnership, the engineering team is also considering how best to meet or exceed the policy goals for these facilities. Light rail operates best in relatively straight and flat lines and stations require flat ground for operation and also to meet or exceed accessibility requirements. Additionally, floodplains, utility conflicts, historic properties, parks, and recreation spaces, and other aspects of the physical environment can guide the design. At this phase, the engineering team is assessing all of these factors to determine where and how the light rail lines would operate within the existing physical environment. Each of these factors, as well as community feedback on specific local issues and needs, go into the development of the design plans. In these next few slides, we'll review the light rail technical requirements to demonstrate some of the constraints that we're working with as we design the project. In addition, we'll talk about how light rail vehicles travel through intersections and the considerations that go into selecting station locations. The maximum grade that a transitway can navigate without costly engineering solutions is approximately a 6% slope. Similarly, stations should not be located on an incline, but instead should be on flat land in order to accommodate all users as they board and depart the trains. The maximum and minimum curve radius does vary based on a number of different factors. <clears throat> the light rail vehicles cannot make hard turns. Rather, the vehicles require wide and sweeping turns to operate efficiently. Similarly, in order for the train doors to align with the station platform, a train must be in a straight line at the station platform to provide safety and accessibility for riders. Operation of the transitway also requires that other vehicles turn at signalized intersections rather than crossing the transitway. 
This slide illustrates an example of how a car might make a left hand turn on an existing roadway without light rail by turning left directly across travel lanes. With a light rail transit way, the auto traffic would need to go to the signalized intersection to make a U-turn and then come back to access the driveway of their destination. The image on the right is the same one from the previous slide, which shows how a vehicle turns while the light rail vehicle is stopped at the intersection. During this time, vehicles that are turning and crossing the transitway will be able to do so. The left-hand image, however, shows the light rail vehicles traveling straight through the intersection, along with the vehicles that are traveling straight on the same roadway. Light rail vehicles will be given priority treatment at intersections to ensure travel times are faster and more reliable. Much of our work in selecting station locations was conducted in earlier phases. But this slide provides a helpful high level summary of how we evaluated where to locate a station along a corridor. Stations should maximize their connections to the existing transit network, ideally providing stations that can be used by multiple bus routes or light rail routes. They should balance speed and access with stop spacing, meaning that when we zoom out from the station to see how far a passenger could reasonably walk on foot or bike, we're looking for a balance in coverage. Our goal is to minimize overlap in lower density areas while at the same time minimizing gaps in coverage. In higher density areas, we may want more overlap between coverage areas to serve the most users conveniently. Finally, we should serve high population and high activity areas, meaning stations would ideally be located close enough to the places people want to go so that once they arrive at the station, they can walk or bike to their final destination with relative ease. Sometimes it's challenging to imagine how all of this will come together, so we wanted to share some example images of how these elements look in other communities. Here, the left and center image provide examples of how a street level transit way might look. The image on the right shows an elevated transit way. In this slide, we're showing images of how a transit way might look as it goes into or comes out of an underground tunnel or subway. These structures are called portals. We will talk more about portals in the downtown working groups for each of the lines. Here we show some example images of light rail stations from other communities. The image on the left shows a street level station in downtown Minneapolis. The center image shows an elevated station in Dallas. And the image on the right shows an underground station in Seattle. Now that we've covered the basics of the engineering process and requirements, we'll talk about the orange line specifically and how we've applied these basics to the project's 15% design. The locally preferred alternative shared with the community in June of 2020 was a combination of the mode, white rail, the transitway, which provides dedicated space for transit, and the vertical profile. We shared the profile you see here as part of the earlier design phase for the project. We wanted to update you on some of the more significant design advances that have been made since the adoption of the LPA to provide a better overall picture of what the Orange Line design plans look like today. For now, an overview. Working from the south through Oldsworth, the vertical profile being shown today is the same as shown previously. We still have multiple configuration options for both the transitway and station at SoCo. We are also proposing a subway from Auditorium Shores to Government Center Capital West Station meaning that the project would tunnel under Lady Bird Lake. This tunnel was formerly shown ending north of Lady Bird Lake. There are still some options under consideration for the exact location of the tunnel's end or north and south portal. We're proposing a street level transitway between UT West Mall and Crestview Station. We are now proposing an elevated station at Crestview and an elevated transitway crossing I-35 between Parmer and Tech Ridge. These are both elevated primarily to avoid conflicts with other transportation facilities. On this slide, you'll also notice some icons that we've incorporated throughout the next set of slides. Let's take a second to review them. The rectangle with the word bus inside indicates that the station provide connections to local bus route. The circle with the letter P inside indicates that we are currently proposing a park and ride at that location. A clear circle with a gold outline and a G inside indicates that the station provides a connection to the future gold line. A blue circle with a B inside indicates that that station provides a connection to the blue line, another light rail line in the initial investments. 
a clear circle with a purple outline and an M inside indicates that the station provides a connection to a metro rapid route. A red square with an R inside indicates that the station provides a connection to the red line, Austin's existing commuter rail line. Finally, a green square with a G inside indicates that the station provides a connection to the green line, a future commuter rail line. As you can see, though we are focused on the orange line in this presentation, we are considering how the orange line would connect to other services within the existing and future transit system. These icons are carried forward throughout the rest of the next set of slides to help you understand how this project connects to the Project Connect system as a whole. Over the next group of slides, we'll be walking through a series of aerial views for the entire Orange Line project. We will call out specific aspects of the project we want to bring to your attention. Reminder that significantly more details on all of these areas are available in the working group videos, which are also posted on this website. Kimi will get us started in South Austin. Thanks, Jonathan. Starting from the southern end of the corridor, the transit way follows South Congress Avenue, meaning that all of the stations will be along South Congress. As indicated by the dotted orange line, the Slaughter and William Cannon stations are not part of the initial investment, so they would not likely be built as part of the first project, but could be built as part of a future extension. Slaughter Station would likely be near the Ralph Ablanado Drive and would include a park and ride connected to I-35. This connection would provide convenient access for those coming south on I-35. The William Cannon Station would be placed near the William Cannon Drive intersection. The Stastny Station would serve as the interim southern end for the initial investment and would include a park and ride and bus space for multimodal connectivity. Before we get started, let's do a quick orientation to the layout of the next group of slides. In the top left, you'll see the station or area that we are focusing on. In the top right, you'll see a list of numbers and notes. When you look at the center aerial image, you'll see that there are also numbers. The number on the image matches to a corresponding note on the right side of the page. Additionally, on most of the aerial images, you'll see green arrows at each of the station platforms. These green arrows indicate how pedestrians would access the station platform. Below the notes, you'll see a cross-section diagram. This corresponds to the matching letter on the aerial image. This is an engineering concept used to show what the right of way would look like if you crossed it at a particular location. For these cross sections, orange indicates light rail tracks and stations, green indicated the pedestrian and bicycle facilities, generally with a tree and furniture zone between them, and then gray indicates the general purpose lanes or lanes used for cars, buses, or truck through and turning traffic. Finally, across the bottom of the slide, you can see the full Orange Line project to better demonstrate where along the project we are in each image. Now to discuss this slide specifically. Because Slaughter would eventually serve as the end of line, a new park and ride is proposed. This station would be located off of Congress for convenient access by patrons and connecting buses. Through this area, the project would be built at grade and the crossing you see that brings the project into the middle of the existing South Congress would also be built at grade and managed with signals. From foremost to Ditmar, we anticipate that the road and trackway will be at the same elevation, but that they would be raised above where they exist today to accommodate a new bridge structure at Boggy Creek. Other than this, the track is anticipated to run at street level and in the middle of the existing roadway in this area. As we approach William Cannon, you can see that the station would be split on both sides of the intersection. This means the southbound platform would be located south of the intersection and the northbound platform would be located on the north side. This allows for a narrower station and can accommodate left turns without additional right of way needed. The platforms are served by two different directions of train traffic. The platform on the north side of the intersection is served by the northbound traffic and the platform on the south side is served by southbound traffic. The trains do not cross between the platforms and this is true of all split platform stations you'll see throughout the presentation. Generally speaking, a center platform is the ideal alignment. However, a split platform is sometimes used in situations with constrained right of way. 
We reviewed the basics of station layouts in a series of public meetings in April. So to learn more, go to projectconnect.com and visit the Get Involved page and then scroll to the bottom to look at previous virtual meetings. Throughout this area, the track is street level and runs in the middle of the roadway. As a reminder, Stastny is the start of the initial investment. Based on the preliminary design, the South Con Congress Transit Center station will likely be an above ground station due to conflicts near SH-71 and SH-290 frontage roads and Radham Lane. The St. Edward station would be located near the intersection of Lightsea and South Congress. Just south of this view, the tracks begin to shift to the side of the road. This occurs just north of Little Texas Lane via a signalized intersection. This shift is to accommodate the proposed new park and ride station just north of the Stastny intersection at street level. This park and ride station is proposed because Stastny would be the initial investment terminus. Just south of the proposed Stastny station, right of way ownership shifts from TxDOT to the city of Austin. Just north of Mockingbird Lane, the tracks begin to elevate to avoid Williamson Creek and the associated floodplain. As we continue north, you can see that the guideway crosses back over the existing lanes and drops back into the center of the roadway. Through coordination with multiple divisions within the city of Austin, we anticipate closing Wasson Road to accommodate this transition back to center and at grade tracks. Just north of Sheridan Avenue, the guideway begins a transition to an elevated structure as it approaches the South Congress Transit Center or SCTC. Elevating the guideway and the SCTC station allows us to avoid traffic impacts at Ben White Boulevard and SH-71 in Rodham Lane. North of the SH-71 Ben White intersection, the transitway begins to lower back down to the middle of South Congress. The tracks here are at grade by Alpine Street and run in the center at grade through the St. Ed station. We are currently showing a split platform for the St. Edward Station on either side of the Woodward Street intersection. We are also considering a center running platform for the station and are working with St. Edwards and other stakeholders to determine which options will move forward. The Old Torf Station would be near the existing 801 Metro Rapid Stop at Old Torf. The location of the South Congress and Auditorium Shores stations are still being determined. A general area is indicated here. This is also the area that the light rail line will make a turn to follow the alignment of Guadalupe Street. Progressing along, the transit way would continue at street level and in the center through the Old Horse Station area. The proposed Old Horse Station is a center platform positioned to, to the south of Old Horse intersection. This does require more right of way as shown, um, and a split platform is not possible due to the roadway curvature north of Old Horse. We anticipate being able to accommodate full separated bicycle and pedestrian facilities throughout this area. At the corner of College and Old Torf, we are aware of a historical building that will not be impacted, though the parcel it sits on is not historic and may be impacted. Multiple design options are under consideration, which could impact the vertical alignment of transitway and station location in the business district of South Congress. You are currently viewing the surface level option. Another option would include an extension of the subway to Live Oak. These options are discussed in the SoCo Working Group video. Regardless of where the subway tunnel ends and the south portal is located, the transitway is underground in the southern approach to the Auditorium Shores Station. You can see how the transitway also leaves the alignment of Congress in this area. Because it is underground, there will be no right-of-way impacts in this area and the exact station location is adjustable. This is the best path to avoid utilities and create access to activity centers and to maintain a higher level of service via higher design speed using a sweeping curve as shown here in the slide. The tunnel continues but underground and the transitway begins to come in line with Guadalupe just north of the river. A minor note here is to mention that the transparent building on the left, this building is not in the aerial views because it was recently constructed. Several slides have similar shadow buildings so that the aerial views better reflect the current and as we all know, ever-changing landscape of structures in this area. The Republic Square station will be underground in the vicinity of 4th Street. This is also where the orange and blue lines will connect. The Government Center slash Capital West Station will also be underground, and this is where I'll hand it off to Christina to walk you through the rest of the project. 
Thanks, Kimmy. We anticipate providing roadway improvements in the area north of 3rd Street and north of 6th Street, even though the transitway is underground in this area. This is because we are currently proposing a cut and cover tunnel rather than a board tunnel for construction only. So the roadway would be rebuilt as part of construction. We are currently proposing a minimum of three pedestrian entrances, including a signature entrance just to the north of 4th Street on the west side of Guadalupe. There are three options for the government center station location that are still being evaluated. These options are discussed in the downtown working group video. The north portal is where light rail vehicles headed south will enter the subway and vehicles headed north will exit the subway. The option shown proposes the north portal located north of MLK Boulevard. An additional option would place the north portal south of MLK Boulevard between 16th and 18th streets. These options are also discussed in the downtown working group video. The UT West Mall 24 Street Station has the highest pedestrian activity in the corridor and the platforms will be located in proximity to the West Campus entrance on the drag. Hemphill Park, another high pedestrian activity station, would likely be between 27th and 29th streets. Reconfiguring the existing Nueces, North Guadalupe, and 29th streets is critical to improving mobility throughout the West Campus area. There are three operational configuration options in the drag area, but all of the options have the UT West Mall Station as a center platform in the same general area as shown in this image. Pedestrian access would be provided on both sides of the platform, though you can only see one side in this view. It's important to note that all options also include some reduction of vehicle travel lanes through the drag area. These options are discussed in the drag working group video. The operational configuration options in the drag area extend through the Hemphill Park Station area shown on this slide. Due to the anticipated vehicle traffic lane reductions on Guadalupe, a new connection from Dean Keaton to San Antonio is required. This image shows the proposed center-aligned Hemphill Park Station. Additionally, we are proposing to reconfigure the 29th and Guadalupe intersection to improve safety and access. Nueces is one-way today, but the City of Austin plans to change the operation of this street to two-way. The reconfiguration of this intersection, in conjunction with the Orange Line Guideway, will work better for two-way traffic on Nueces, as well as providing a much safer crossing than the current intersection. This slide is an excellent example of station spacing for a moderately dense area. The Hyde Park Station is proposed in the area of the 38th Street intersection. The Triangle Station is proposed within the heart of the Triangle Development Area. We recognize the importance of maintaining the community character in this area. At the same time, the right-of-way in this area is very constrained. We are coordinating with Austin State Hospital leadership to leverage some of their property. The Austin State Hospital has historical significance and we are working with the Texas Historic Commission to maintain those elements. We also recognize that several of the businesses on the east side are also historic structures. A center platform in the heart of the triangle area is proposed. We provide one lane of through traffic throughout this area and the inside lane will be for left turns at signalized intersections. As the guideway transitions to North Lamar, two vehicular lanes will be maintained adjacent to the newly developed state owned facilities. The Koenig station would be located in the vicinity of the Koenig intersection. The Crestview area will connect multiple types of transit the North Lamar Transit Center exists today, but we would be expanded as part of this project. This is the northern end of the initial project investment. The existing right-of-way is extremely constrained in this area, including the entire length of North Lamar from the Triangle to Airport Boulevard, which is north of this image. Because of this, we are showing full bicycle and pedestrian facilities in this area 
but the tree furniture zone varies based on the right-of-way constraints and minimizing impacts to structures. The tracks are at grade and running in the center in this area. The center platform Koenig Station is located south of the intersection. The Crestview area will be a very special place as it will connect the Orange Line, Red Line, local bus routes, and improved bicycle and pedestrian facilities. As such, there is significant opportunity to improve North Lamar and Airport Boulevard traffic flow, as well as create a signature station that creates a more walkable area. The current proposal is to depress the red line beneath North Lamar. The freight line, which only operates late at night, will remain at grade. The orange line will be elevated above the freight line and the Crestview station will be elevated. There may be opportunities for transit oriented development in this area and redeveloping the area for connectivity will be key as we progress the design. It's important to note here that this design is very preliminary and we are still exploring design options in this area. The tracks would be located in the center of the main travel lanes of Lamar through the 183 intersection. The North Lamar Transit Center, or NLTC, will serve as the initial terminus for the project and will take advantage of the existing NLTC park and ride. The station will be located in the middle of North Lamar. A new pedestrian bridge will connect the station to both the NLTC and the community to the east. Several designs for the pedestrian bridge are under consideration. We will be prepared to discuss these designs next year. As density decreases, the distance between stations increases. Since this part of the corridor will be implemented in the future, in the interim, these areas will continue to be served by the 801 Metro Rapid, where they will tie into the North Lamar Transit Center. The Tech Ridge Park and Ride will also be connected to I-35. In this area, we are proposing to add some signalized intersections. Additional signalized intersections would also increase bike pedestrian connectivity. The Runberg station is shown as a split platform station. In this area, the transit way is located in the center of the existing roadway and we anticipate providing full bicycle and pedestrian facilities with the full tree furniture zone. While the right of way in these areas is relatively wide, slivers of right of way will be needed in the areas where there are left turn lanes. The breaker station is in the vicinity of Chinatown and is currently shown as a split platform to the north and south of the breaker intersection. In the area of the proposed Palmer Station, the tracks would be at street level. The Palmer Station is proposed as a split platform to the north and south of Palmer Lane. Full and separate bicycle and pedestrian facilities are shown in this area as well. Traveling north, the tracks begin to gain elevation to cross over I-35. The Tech Ridge Park and Ride Station will be further designed in the future. For now, the station is located in the area south of the bus loading zone, but this could all be reconfigured. It is critical that the guideway line up to cross over I-35 to hit Center Ridge Drive on the other side because TxDOT is proposing to connect the managed lanes of I-35 to the Tech Ridge Park and Ride. It's important to note here that this design is very preliminary and we are still exploring design options in this area. With that, I'll turn it over to Abby to wrap up. Thanks, Christina. Before we close out, we wanted to provide a brief review of the environmental analysis process that is currently underway. We talked a lot about this process during the scoping round of public meetings in January, and you can see those materials at projectconnect.com. An important part of this phase of the project is to identify and evaluate the potential effects that the project may have on the physical, natural, human, and cultural environments. During this process, we gather information about places and resources, both from the community and through extensive data collection. We then analyze the environmental, social, and economic impacts of the project and share those findings with the community for feedback. This helps us understand community concerns and identify mitigation strategies so that we can better inform the decision-making process. 
On this slide, we've listed the environmental topics to be analyzed in the environmental impact station uh, statement that we're currently developing. Some of these are self-explanatory, but some are a little less so. So we wanted to provide some additional details. Energy refers to the analysis of construction and operational energy requirements and the potential for energy savings. Noise and vibration refers to the evaluation of noise and vibration caused by a transit system on nearby residences and other sensitive land use types, including schools, hospitals, concert halls, recording studios, and places of worship, among others. Environmental justice refers to the study of potential disproportionately high and adverse effects on low income and minority populations. And finally, visual and aesthetic refers to the evaluation of how the project is seen by both users and neighbors. We would like to hear more about what topic areas are important to you and any concerns or feedback you have on these subjects. So please include these comments in the feedback portion of this page below this video. We wanted to give you some additional details about what's coming next. There are some key milestones for the project. Looking ahead to next spring, we will come back with 30% design plans and complete our evaluation for the draft environmental impact statement. In summer of 2022, we will complete the draft environmental impact statement documentation and the 30% comment phase, and then submit for an initial rating from the Federal Transit Administration. In winter of 2022, we anticipate the completion of the final environmental impact statement as well as receipt of the record of decision from the FDA. We hope that you will share the word with your friends, neighbors, and colleagues about this project so they can visit the website to review materials and provide feedback. Feedback received by the project team on or before August 27, 2021 will be included in the official summary report for this phase of outreach. As mentioned early in the presentation, more details about the concept design are available in the working group videos on this website. Each video is organized by geographic area. In the videos, the engineering team will review the 15% design schematics, which are a technical tool used by the engineering team to develop and communicate the project's design. After each video, you complete the questions below the video and tell us what you think about the project's design in that area, including strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities. There are other ways to provide feedback. These include sending an email to orangeline at catmetro.org, mailing us your comment to Capital Metro, 607 Congress Avenue, Austin, Texas, 78701, or calling our project hotline at 512-369-7703. Community input is a critical part of the project development process, and the Orange Line will have new information to share with the community for feedback regularly throughout the next year. Stay up to date on project developments by joining our email mailing list. So you can do that by visiting projectconnect.com and subscribing to the newsletter. You can follow Cat Metro on Twitter at Cat Metro ATX, and you can follow the Austin Transit Partnership at ADP uh, underscore org. You can like us on Facebook at facebook.com backslash Capital Metro and facebook.com slash Austin Transit Partnership. Thank you again for your participation and ongoing involvement in Project Connect.